Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and begin this webinar. So normally, so first Friday of every month, we are here live on YouTube. And every Tuesday, the Friday of every first Friday of every month is just anybody can come. We're going to talk about all instruments, any instruments, all types of trades. For the Tuesday, we have the pre-market analysis for stock uh, for the stock market up, and that's focused on stocks. So we go over analysis, potential trade ideas, levels we're watching, how we want to trade it um, before we go live trading in the uh, in the members area. So we have a live trading channel in the members area where I share all my trades, my stock trades for that day. So um, this one though is just, we are gonna cover every instrument. We can cover any asset class. Um, we can do anything from just pure stock trades to we can look at uh, options. We can look at uh, Ichimoku if needs be. We can look at everything. This is kind of just an open session. Now, there are some ground rules for this. First off, as always, uh, neutral or positive language. We do not create and we do not uh, want an environment of people participating in uh, you know, ways of mutual disrespect or any sort of disrespect. So we always use neutral positive tone. Um, we're not, we don't get into politics or religion, anything there. We're just focused on trading and how we can improve your trading performance and how we can give you the tools so that you can have a method of income building that creates freedom for you. That's what this is about, is so that you can get more time, get more freedom, and be able to do things on your own terms. And in the coronavirus right now, it's in, you know just the situation globally, it seems kind of like the most opportune time to become a trader, to learn to trade, because it gives you the options to take your income into your own hands uh, for the most part. And you know, obviously it's dependent upon the market, but it, it gives you an option to make money that you don't have to go anywhere to do it. You don't have to put your health at risk. And so this is just such an important time to be trading, to learn to trade and develop the skill, whether you're going to trade full-time or part-time, it doesn't really matter to be able to have this skill is, you know, more apropos than ever. Um, so again, in terms of language, we focus on neutral, positive language. You can disagree with me. You can have a difference of opinion. I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any problem with having a, you know, very, gentlemanly discussion or disagreement, but we do it in the in the style of respect and we do it with communication that's respectful. If there's no respect between two people, then there's no communication. So um, that's the first ground rule. The second ground rule is no spamming or promoting other services. This webinar is not here for you to, I've had some people come in the past, train users to promote their services or how great a trader they are. This is not for you. If you start doing that, you'll be just kicked out. Um, and then the last thing is, is that when you want to analyze a trade, either that you're in now or you're looking at, or you want analysis on a particular currency or stock or instrument, whatever it is, the rules are very simple. First thing you do is list the instrument. So list the symbol itself. You know, if it's gold and you're thinking GLD ETF, then you say GLD. But if you're thinking gold versus US dollar, you put XAU USD. So put the symbol name first, you know, as it's written out. Then you're going to put in the time frame, and then you're going to put a one sentence description on what your analysis is. You know, hey, I'm bullish. I see an impulsive corrective series that's up right now. I'm looking to get in at this price, stop loss, take profit. If you have an entry, stop loss, and take price or take profit on the potential trade idea or your current trade, I need that to be able to analyze it and give you feedback on all aspects of your entry, your stop loss, take profit, and the price action context leading up to that. Um, if you just say, Hey, Chris, you know, what about gold? What's your thoughts on gold? That's passive learning. That's just you pushing the onus of the work to me and say, Hey, Chris, please do the work for me. Tell me what you think about gold without putting yourself out there or challenging your own thinking and putting your own thinking out there. So when you put your own thinking out there, that's active learning. When you just pass it off and say, Hey, Chris, please tell me what your thoughts are on gold. That's passive learning. You're never going to become a better trader by doing that. It doesn't matter how much information I show you or give you, you're not going to become a better trader. You have to put your own mind and thoughts out there. Plus that also shows me what you see and don't see in the markets. And it gives me kind of a, a vector to be able to analyze your skill level and give feedback based on that. So hello, Will. Good to see you. Um, Kevin's saying, uh, if I want to learn options from you, which course should I take? We're doing an options boot camp probably in a couple months from now. So either August or September. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I'm already building the material for that. Strategies that I'd like to share, you know, how do we want to teach it? So yeah, we're going to do an options boot camp that'll be intro to options. It'll give people an introductory foundation. And then we're going to go over strategies that I employ. Um, the great thing that I've learned with options is that the majority of options traders that are out there, like the big options traders out there, 
they're not necessarily the best technical analysts. In fact, that's probably like lower end on their skill. They make money because they're just really good at options and they're really good at using them and manipulating them in the right way. But they don't have great technical skills. And so I happen to have really good technical skills. It's just, that's just one of my, it's, you know, it's one of the few skill sets I have in trading. And so to be able to combine that with options gives me like just a totally different weapon to use options. Like I've already come up with strategies on how to use options that after reading 15, 20 books and going through a hundred plus videos on options, I haven't seen anybody talk about. So either they're doing it and not telling people, or they don't even know about these strategies, like this potential ways to use options. So yeah, that's, um, we'll be talking about that in the boot camp. So stay tuned. Um, okay, so uh, we will do Q&A. Um, because this is kind of free flowing, you can ask questions at any time. Ideally, your question is relevant to what we're talking about right now. If it's not relevant, then I'll just push it slightly back in the queue because I don't just want to jump from topic to topic to topic to topic. So, uh, Fouad, we can discuss that afterwards. So contact us by email after. Um, so Hedge saying, I learned a lot from your last webinar, implemented a lot of techniques and had a nice profit week. Awesome, congratulations for that. Manu saying, bad trading week for you. Bad trading week, why bad? Why bad? There's some really good trade opportunities. Oh, there's no sweetener in that tea. Give me one second. Let me put some sweetener in there. Um, and then let's uh, get into charts and trades. All right, have to have some stevia in my tea. All right. Negative mindset, Will? I'm not sure that I understand what that means. Okay. All right. So who wants to go first with chart time frame? This can be a trade that you're either in or a trade you're looking at. Um, if it's Forex, we will use the 20 MA. And if it's stocks, we'll use VWAP and volume. So that's to be expected. Uh, we do have a question from Edward. Chris, please show how you enter and place a stop at a roll reversal area. What triggers the entry? And do you go to smaller time frames to determine entry? So there's some things about that that aren't going to be fixed ways of answering this, Edward, because we place, so in terms of how we place a stop at a roll reversal level area, well, the stop loss, the best way to think about a stop loss is where should the market not go if your trade idea is correct? So if I'm placing it at a role reversal area, there's probably some level at some point beyond that level that the market should not go that if my trade theory is correct, it shouldn't go to that. And if it goes to that, then that means my trade theory is not correct. Now there's no fixed, I don't have a fixed rule for that because how the price action leads up to a role reversal level is going to be different on every single chart. So if it's different on every single chart, I can't have a fixed rule now, can I? Like if there can be a million or even an infinite amount of permutations of how the price action leads up to a rule reversal level, well, then there's no way I can have an absolute fixed rule, can I? So, <laughs> so uh, you know, with that being said, if you have a specific chart, like a role reversal level you want me to look at, then I can say, hey, here's how I would place the stop loss based on this. Here's why I would place it here. And so I can give you the skill, but I don't know of anybody that any, any real professional trader that's like, okay, I always place a 20 pip stop loss beyond a role reversal level because volatility is elastic. The price section is gonna be different going into each one. And each pair is gonna have different levels of volatility. So it wouldn't make sense to have like a fixed size stop loss or anything like that. And you could say, oh, well, the candle before, but the candle before can be really small, can be really big. So that's going to change the nature of that strategy. So does that make sense, Edward, in terms of, in terms of the stop part of that? Now, if you have, again, if you have a specific chart with a roll reversal level, I'll be happy to analyze it and show you how I apply my skills to that. Um, what triggers the entry? The entry, and if you're asking what type of order, it can be a market or a limit order. What, in terms of what would trigger it, it would be the price action context before that. So depending upon the price action context before that, that would determine what will trigger that. If, for example, let's 
do kind of a drawing here. Let me see if I can actually, before I do a drawing, let me give uh, some white space on a chart to make this easier. So let's, okay, let's work with some white space here. So let's compare two RRLs. So a role reversal level is where the role of the level becomes, it changes from either support to resistance or from support to resistance or resistance to support. So let's say we have a movement that's like this. Okay. <clears throat> or another way to put this would be like the market's bullish. It hits a level, bounces back, and then it breaks through this level. And then it comes back to that. Okay. So this is a with trend environment. And, you know, this could be like a corrective pullback. And this could be an impulsive move. So I have an impulsive, corrective, impulsive, corrective move into the role reversal level. Okay, well, that price action context alone, especially if it's re respected like prior levels, would be communicative that the market is respecting prior levels, stair-stepping its way up. So I would just automatically get in on the level. I don't need to wait for some candlestick pattern or some pin bar or anything like that. If the market is respecting that level and I'm right about my trade idea, then this is the most optimal entry. So that's how I'd be getting into that. Does that make sense, Edward? Yes, no? Okay, so let's get into Manisha's question and then we'll get into Joshua's question here. So... Chris, you say in YouTube videos that you don't go for confirmation signals and that they reduce your profitability. Then what price action makes you enter a trade? What do you actually look for to enter a trade? I look for highly imbalanced order flow. I look for highly imbalanced price action. I look for very consistent price action. I look for levels that have represented key you know, order flow areas in the past. There's a lot of things I look at. We really go over this in detail in the course, but it's not like I'm looking for like, oh, these two candlesticks or these three candlesticks should show up like this. That's, you know, it, it doesn't really make much sense to me to just look at a couple candlesticks when I can get a lot of information as to what's going on by looking at, you know, the structure, the gestalt of the price action. So I'm looking for with trend as much as possible. I probably take 85 to 90 plus percent of my trades with trend. I, I tend to, I, and the reason being, it's very simple and very straightforward. I like to trade with the most dominant order flow possible. So that is the way I like to trade with. So I like to trade with trend as much as possible. And that could be, depending upon the price section context, that could be a breakout style trade. That could be a breakout pullback. That could be a pullback trade. It just depends upon the structure itself. So in terms of what price section, it's highly clear, highly imbalanced order flow and price action to with trend most of the time. So yeah, we have we have models in the price action course where we talk about this much more in detail. And when these models line up, it's saying, look, your highest probability direction is up or is down. That's the direction we want to trade. And then based on the models, it will tell us what types of strategies we want to use. So if we have this type of trend, we'll use this strategy. If we have this type of trend, we'll use this strategy. And if we have this type of trend, we'll use this strategy. So that's how we do that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. What do you actually look for to enter trade? So I feel like I've covered all that. Um, okay, we've got a couple of trade ideas coming in just a second here. Chris, it is my understanding that I can check time and sales only through a broker's platforms that showed this data like TS. There's no other service or way to check that in real time, correct? As far as I know, um, there might be in the stock market, You know, there might be some platforms that have time and sales available without actually being a broker platform that's possible um but i'm not aware of that so yeah generally you're getting that through the brokers platform because they have the feeds direct like in the stock market they have the feeds directly with the exchanges they're getting the time and sales from the exchanges and they're putting that into the time and sales window uh no it's totally fine it's all good stefano okay so we had a question from joshua and then we will look at uh, Michelle's trade idea and then Fouad's trade idea and then another one for Michelle and then Jason. Okay, so let's see. Who is the next question? Next question is Joshua Chen. 
which currency pairs do you recommend for starting traders? Just started watching, by the way. It got recommended by a friend. Awesome. All right. Uh, in terms of currency pairs, I recommend the my first suggestion is to pick regionally based pairs. So, for example, if you are in Asia, I would recommend that the biggest core of the currency pairs that you watch are going to be related to that region that you live in and you're going to be trading in. So if you're in Asia, that would be yen based pairs. It could be Chinese yuan. It could be Australian Kiwi dollar. Reason being is most likely you're trading during your waking hours, your daytime hours. And so that's where you're going to have a lot of information. That's where a lot of flows will be happening. So it's super important that you're trading ones that are most regionally related to you. If somebody was in North America, I would not recommend that they trade like CAD yen, you know, that because that's, you could trade CAD yen or if somebody was in Asia, I would not recommend them trading like dollar CAD because dollar CAD really has no, there's very little flows going into Asia at that time period. It's just very inactive. So it wouldn't be prudent to relate some, to something that's completely outside of your region. So yeah, make sure you trade things that are as close to your region. Um, ideally, as many majors as possible, but you can also have some cross pairs as well in there. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Does that help, Joshua? Yes, no? Roz is saying sorry, money. That's twice this week, Roz. <laughs> you missed one of the stock ones or you're late on the stock one? That's okay. It's, it's like holiday week. I don't really care. Whenever you show up is whenever you show up. Okay, let's look at some trade questions here. So Michelle has Kiwi dollar four hour, uh, Kiwi dollar four hour. So looking for breakout of this corrective structure towards 6580 area. Okay, so I, right now this price action on the Kiwi dollar is very bullish since the bounce, you know, impulsive, huge corrective structure at the top. You can see this kind of pressure building at the breakout here. So rejection, rejection, rejection. Very weak sell-off carry by the 20MA and breakout. You could have done breakout pullback. And it's just carried along this 20MA for a high momentum move. Now we have a consolidation corrective structure at the top, which is very bullish. Anytime you have an impulsive move followed by a corrective structure at the top of the trend, that indicates that the most probabilistic direction is to the upside than the downside. So we want to be trading that as much as possible. Um, clearly, there is a strong area of support right around 63.98. So if it does happen to get back down here, then I would be looking to buy that, take profit at the top of the corrective structure, or maybe take some off the board and hopes that it breaks out of this. Um, you're looking for four hour looking for breakout of the corrective structure towards 65.80. Am I missing another corrective structure? Do you mean this one, Michelle? Like here? Is that what you're thinking? Yes, no, Michelle? Because I am kind of, I mean, I kind of see what you're saying. This is kind of a sub-corrective structure inside of this corrective structure. So maybe you're thinking, hey, a break out of this towards this. If you're thinking that, you probably want to go to maybe a slightly smaller time frame, maybe like a one hour. Um, and let's redo this. And then, yeah, it's pretty bullish right now. I mean, if you look at <clears throat> look at the rejections towards the upper end of this range, pretty strong. Brief bounce of the 20 million back through. This one bounced of the 20 million. Now the 20 million is carrying it. So buyers are just continually stepping in along the way. In fact, there's even kind of like a micro level inside here. Bam, bam, and bam, bam. So it's kind of building this structure from here to here is building a breakout structure. <clears throat> as long as this 20 may keeps the hold, then that's just going to put pressure on this. And eventually that's going to clear this. And then it's going to go for 65, 56 and then 67 up to here, maybe up to 80. There's definitely a possibility, but right now it's all bullish. I, there's nothing in the price section right now that suggests to me that bears are in control or going to take control anytime soon. It's possible. They may reject it up here and send it back down here. Fine. But that doesn't mean that the bears are overall in control. That means it's just profit taking by bulls and some bears stepping in. And the overall structure is impulsive, corrective to the right. So that means the next direction is most likely up. So even inside all of this, um, yeah, even inside all this, that's that's what I'm seeing on that. So hopefully I answer your question. Um, okay. 
That is covers that. Okay, so um, scrolling up the questions. We've got Joshua's Fawad saying Aussie Kiwi. Four are more bullish. Um, 106, 36. Take profit 108, 13. Stop loss 105. Okay, so let's see what you got. Um, in the four hour, 106.36. Um, I'm not totally sold on that level. Let me see it on the weekly if it's there. Yeah, I don't really, I mean, I kind of see it. You got some here, you got some here. There's some of that, but it's not, it's, yeah, that kind of dices through a lot. It, there's a lot of price action on both sides, so it's not my favorite level. And on a shorter term time frame, because of this downside rejection here and this rejection here, it's almost like I would have my own level down here. Short term, it's kind of bullish because you have impulsive move with a corrective structure at the top, but the highs are fading. Uh, so you got higher high, higher high, lower high, lower high, but then lower low, lower high here. You know, this is kind of a lower high than that one. And so it's not bouncing nicely. So if somebody was considering along, I really wouldn't consider it until this level here, 105.81. I don't see the 106.30 as being a great level. I see it more as an interior level. So where your stop loss rate is right now, that's if I was going to take this trade, that would be the area to actually looking to get in. That's often the difference between, between struggling retail and professionals that a lot of times the places where the retail trader will get stopped out is actually where the professional trader is looking to get in. That happens a lot. So your stop losses actually would be my, would be my entry on this one here. Short term, you're seeing lower highs, lower highs, impulsive corrective. So it looks like it wants to take a stab down here at least to 10608. But yeah, there's going to definitely be some pressure to want to touch this before. And the most significant buying inside this corrective structure, if this is what you're thinking, the most significant buying is here and here. There's some decent buying here, but that only really holds for this big move, whereas this started this whole big move and this started the last decent move. So yeah, that's what I'm seeing on that one here. Hopefully answer your question on that. Um, Jason, I kind of went over my NZD analysis. Do you still need me to do that or... Because I kind of went on there. Okay, it's 4 p.m. in London. It had a lot of meetings at work. All good in the hood? All good in the hood. Okay, Manu Ramon says, I've spent five years learning Forex. I've developed a lot of winning strategies. Back tested them, but when I go live, I keep bouncing from one strategy. And I can't keep one strategy. Help me, please. That's mindset, Manu. That's all mindset. Yeah, that's, that's everything you're saying here is mindset. Clearly, there's some technical skill in place because you're able to create a strategy and not just create a strategy, you're able to create one that when you back test, it makes money. So that's that. if the transition, if you're able to do fine in demo and simulator and then you go live and you're just, you know, you're not doing anything that uh, part of your trading plan, you're not mentally executing what you need to, you're jumping from strategy to strategy, strategy you have no discipline, no patience, that's mindset. So your focus right now you should probably be spending the next, if you have 10 hours a week to train and build your trading skills, I would suggest spending eight hours of the week on mindset alone and just two hours on the trading side because you've already demonstrated that there is technical skill there. So why would you try and keep building the technical skill when you establish that? It's clear your biggest obstacle right now is mindset. You have to wire, you have to wire the, the habits into your brain that will get you to do what you want to do, not change from strategy to strategy. Keep your you know, trade plan, keep your focus, execute mentally what you set out to do in your mind that you mentally execute that. You have to wire those habits into your brain. So that would be, you know, that would be mindset trading. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, okay. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Nene Aniki, uh, I hope I said your name right. And if I didn't, I apologize. Chris, I hope you're well. I am well. Thank you for asking. Uh, I wish I could straight stocks, but stock market opens when I'm already at work and closes before I get off. Um, 
if that's the U.S. stock market, <clears throat> is that U.S. or your stock market? If it's your stock market, then maybe you can trade the next stock market open when you get off because depending upon where you are in the world, most likely when you are getting off work, there's another stock market that's going to be opening sometime after you get off work. So if you can't trade your local stock market, which I always recommend, but if you can't, then trade the next stock market that's available when you get off work. The key is that you can trade the stock market open because that's where the biggest majority of movement and volatility and volume and trade setups happen. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, Jim Ramon, have you heard about ghost audio? No, I have no idea. I don't even, is that related to trading? I, I'm just curious, ghost audio? I don't, no idea. If it's related to trading, yes. If not, then yeah. Oh, you live in the East Coast. Okay, so you get off work. You get off work in the afternoon. So you leave for work. Oh, because East Coast is 9, yeah, 9.30 a.m. for you. And when you get off. So your option then would be to, you have a couple options then. So because you, you could swing trade, there's nothing wrong with swing trading. You can swing an option trade the stock market, which is fine. You know, a lot of brokers have aftermarket hours things that you can do. So there's several hours after the market closes that you can make extended hours trades. You can do that. If by some chance you were able to get an account with a brokerage and trade the Australian open, you could do that because that would be your afternoon New York. But my recommendation then would be to swing trade and do options on stock markets. Do your analysis after work, stick with higher time frames, you know, four hour daily, weekly, and throw in some options in there to kind of mix it up. You know, some short term options that could be one week or one month expiry, two month, three month expiry. But yeah, swing trade, you know, look for trades that are going to go for multi day runners that break out of multi day structures on the four hour time frame and up. Yeah, that would be my recommendation. If, if I was in that situation, that's what I would do. Um, okay, Shankar Manon saying, please tell how to select momentum stocks for intraday. So we have uh, Shankar every, every single Tuesday, we go over our stock selection process. So come to the Tuesday webinar. We've also had several videos. So, I'll give you an example. Like, so every Tuesday we do pre-market watch list and we also have, I have done two of them now already. And then I have a third video on how to trade live. So how to day trade live. So I've covered a lot of this already, but let's, let's do this real quick. So let me share with you the link. So here's a couple examples of actually, uh, Sasha, do you want to, um, share the links publicly on the YouTube channel. Oh wait, you can't do that. That's right. So I will do that. Okay. So here's an example of a day trading uh, pre-market watch list session. Here's another example where we go over our exact stock selection process. This is everything we do to select stocks, find momentum stocks. And then here is the third link for that. So watch those and then join us on Tuesday. That would be uh, the way to do it. Okay, I have a question from Michelle, and then I got Runer Vigason, and then I got some uh, YouTube questions here. Okay, so Michelle has Aussie CAD four hour. Very strong, very bullish right now. Yeah, it's a good breakout structure. That's a very good breakout structure. This is this is an excellent breakout structure. This is what you're, you know, you're looking for in a breakout structure. You know, what do you, so we have, we have a clear area of resistance that is very important because that tells us where the bears are parking their orders and where the market will need to go to stop them out. The market will need to go above this spike here to stop out pretty much any bear that's been bearish short term from this area. So we need the market to go above this to stop them out. Just getting above here is going to stop out most of them, but I'm willing to bet some are putting their stop just above the spike here. So we have a clear area where the bears are parked and therefore we know what we want the market to do to stop them out. If the bears get stopped out, they get stopped out by a long order. So it helps fuel the breakout position here. Plus also the buyers are stepping up constantly along the way. So they're continuing to build pressure against the bears. This is a great breakout structure. So looking for a break towards 95, 60 area. So let's take a look at that. 
Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you want to get in, you want to get out just before this resistance area. Plus, it's also support, support. Yeah, it's a good level, good target, good structure. It's a very good trade. I like this one. I might do this one for myself. Right. Let me put that in my notes. Okay. Good trade idea. I like it. All right, Runer. Uh, hi, Chris, and thanks for all the good stuff. Can you show me a good example of bank manipulation, please? Meh. I, I think it's an overbloated concept. Um, the only way that I could really give you an example is if I had access to time in sales and level two data. Otherwise, it's only speculation of a bank manipulation trade. Like, I don't know what you mean by bank manipulation, manipulation trade. I don't, I don't have that kind of approach where I'm trying to trade the banks manipulating or trade against them or trade with them or anything like that. There's, there's players in the market who are going to move and make trading decisions on whatever way they want. And it's, you know, it's going to be kind of hard for one bank to manipulate a currency pair, which has so much liquidity globally. Like how would a bank manipulate a euro dollar when there are so many players? It's not like the stock market where you only have so many shares, you know, it would be a little bit easier for a very large player to come in and scoop up a large portion of the shares. But even then it's gonna to start to come through in the orders and the time in sales. But if you don't have access to level two and you don't have access to time in sales, then that's really just speculation. It's just pure speculation. There's no evidence behind it. You would need to be able to see the actual order flow. And we don't see that in FX. We don't have time in sales. We don't have level two data in order for, in FX. You can have level two with your broker but that's just localized to your broker. And your broker is just a small percentage of the large pie in the sky of FX order flow. So, you know, unless you can, you know, show me an example of a chart where you think it's happening and then could show me the level two in time and sales, it's just pure, it's just, it's kind of like saying, oh, well, there's a, there's a leprechaun in the markets and that leprechaun is trading against me. How do you know? How do you know? You know, so I, I would rather not trade on. I would rather trade on things that I can see than trade on things that I can't ever see. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, zero five one four five. How do you properly see a shift in market bias? For me, I'm pound yen. It's long term bearish, but short term and just term bullish. What do you think? Okay. Do you have a time frame? Zero five one four five. Is that your Borg number? Okay, while you're answering that, I'm gonna answer June 12th, 1776 is question. What weight do you give fundamental analysis to your daily trade analysis? In stocks, I give it about five to 10%. If there's a positive news catalyst, um, I will give it some weight because if I have two stocks side by side, equal price, equal value, PD ratios, all these things, the price section structure is the same, but one of them has a positive news catalyst and the other one does not, I'm more likely to trade the one with the positive news catalyst because that's going to attract a lot more traders for that day, create a lot more momentum for that day. In the absence of a news catalyst, then, you know, then I have to just trade what is available. Um, but it doesn't give a whole lot, especially in FX. I'm not really a fundamental guy in FX. It's just not my thing. Part of the reason being is because, so I've been doing FX for 20 years now. And what I've learned is, is that, you know, and when I first started at FXCM as a broker, we had some really good macro traders. Like we have a guy who runs his own fund now. He's a macro trader. Um, we had another guy that was, you know, just a long-term macro traders. We had a lot more technical traders than macro traders. Duke was a technical futures trader. His dad was a technical futures trader. Tom was a bond trader. He did a mix of fundamental and technical. Um, but Chris, the other Chris was a macro trader and Uday was a macro trader and everybody else is mostly technical. So we had two. And the thing about it is, is that I've learned over the years is that 
the fundamentals are constantly shifting and what is important to the market fundamentally one year may not have no value the next year. It just may have absolutely no value. And some of that I get, like, for example, hey, there's a coronavirus this year. That's taking precedent over a lot of situations. So I get that. But if the core fundamental principles and models and framework that you use to analyze the fundamentals is constantly on shifting ground, then that's not really a framework I can work with. And so I'm, that means I'm constantly having to change my framework every single year. How can I make consistent trading decisions and test my framework if my framework constantly has to be deconstructed and reconstructed? Now, contrast to technicals and price action, I haven't had to change the, the underlying framework of how I trade. That framework is stable for making trading decisions. So because of that, it, it gen in FX, it plays almost, it's almost non-existent. And in stocks, it can have five, 10% on that. So uh, hopefully answers your question. Okay. Um, I got a trade idea from Lee here. Uh, I'm still waiting for, oh, he gave it one hour, four. You want me to do three time frame analysis on this one? Zero five, one, four, five. It's, you get one time frame. If I'm having to do three time frames, that, you know, it just, it means one chart is going to take up a lot of, a lot of time and I don't get to get to everybody else. So, um, so pick one of those one hour, four hour daily and, I, and I'll roll with it. Glad to hear June 12th. Awesome. All right. So, um, zero five, you meant four. Hour. Okay. Let's roll with the four. Hour. Let's roll with it. Um, so let's see, where's your original analysis? Okay. So GBB, baby, why it's long-term bearish, but short-term it just turned bullish. What do you think? Um, I think it, the pound yen is very neutral right now. Like the majority of its price action over the last three months has been inside this range. We've had a brief, you know, rally above it and then it failed. Um, and so it's back inside it. And we had a little bit of a rally below it and it's failed. But you're talking 75% of the price action is inside this 131 to, you know, 135 and a half range. So you're talking very neutral with just brief, you know, flirtations outside of this. So I think this is the zone. You got to play this zone, you know, sell at the top by the bottom. If it gets above this zone, then you have potential sell points here because this is resistance here, support here, support here. You might have some resistance here. And then you definitely are going to, you know, probably run into some selling here for sure. Now, if it gets above this, you could take a long-term bias, but then you're going to run into resistance here and here, you know, and then here. So you'd have some resistance on the way up. You could take some short-term day trades possibly, try and capture some of the space in between that. If it clears this one, then it's got the most room before the next upside ceiling, so to say. But while it's inside this corrective structure, you got to play it. Buy off the bottom, sell off the top until it breaks. If it breaks it, these are your upside resistance levels and to the downside those are your downside levels that if you want to short, you know, you want to take profit before these levels. And if you want to buy you, these are your levels they'd be looking to buy. So more of a, a neutral bias than anything. That's my, that's my thoughts on that one. Good question. Um, Joseph font, uh, Uzu Chuku. Sorry if I, Uzo Chuku. Sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, how do you train mindset? So the way the brain works the simplest way to think about it is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is an underlying trait that your brain, my brain, everybody's brains in this webinar right now and everybody on the planet has. And so all brains have the fundamental characteristic of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability to wire new cells and new network connections amongst brain cells. When you wire enough of them together, you create a network and that network allows you to create patterns and habits. They're like deep grooves in the brain. The more you execute that mental thought process, that emotion, that experience, that reaction, that response, the deeper the groove gets. So a good example of this was 
um, about a year and a half ago, I think, no, last winter, not this winter that just went by, the winter before that. Um, so I live in the mountains right now, but we live further up in the mountains. We were so high up in the mountains that our house, which was a three-story house, we had a second floor deck. The snow had built up so much that it actually came to the top of the second floor deck. So we basically would just sled or snowboard off of our deck because we had a giant hill behind our house. So we literally just sled or snowboard down our hill, like in like 15, 20 feet of powder. It was insane. So what we started doing is we kept going down the same tracks again and again and again with our sleds. And eventually that kind of packed the snow down and made the groove deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually the powder itself, which was soft and hard to move through, we just kept going down again and again. And eventually it became this compact, like snow sledding bobsled area, basically, that we could go down really fast. But it could only happen because we could do it again and again and again and again and again. That's how the brain works. That's one of the underlying conditions you have to have to wire new habits and may change your mindset. Mindset is just a collection of habits and beliefs that are very strongly held by you. And you've executed them over and over and over again. And it's based upon how your brain is wired. Well, if you wanna change how your brain is wired and thus change your mindset, which is a level above the neural architecture, then you have to rewire your brain. So you have to use methods and models to rewire those habits. We teach that in the ATM course. So hopefully answers your question. Okay, um, Lee L. So let's look at Euro Kiwi. I love how everybody's doing the same time frame. It makes it so much easier. Four hours is a good time frame. Okay, it's pretty bearish. Um, kind of makes sense with the year with the Kiwi dollar doing bullish right now. This is very bearish. So you have impulsive move, large corrective balancing zone. You have impulsive corrective, impulsive corrective, impulsive. Counter trend impulsive bounce with a corrective structure. You kind of have two corrective structures going on here. So let's get rid of some of these lines. Let's put this line down here. So this is really your corrective structure zone right now. That's where you are right now. And because of this, you know, impulsive, corrective, impulsive, corrective, impulsive, counter and impulsive, corrective, impulsive. And then this just large corrective structure. While the market is below this on a daily closing basis, 76.22, whatever this is, and this, this little spike here, you have to be bearish. You have to be selling these rallies. Any rally up here, you have to be selling. I don't know if it's going to bounce through or break through on this one here, but if it does, then you look for breakout pullback to get long. There's no breakout structure leading up to it. So we wouldn't take a pure breakout trade. Therefore, we'd have to look for a breakout pullback. Um, ideally, the market moves kind of like impulsively and then it correctively pulls back into this. That would be the most ideal situation, but it doesn't have to. Um, either way, if it breaks that, you know, we would be more bearish than bullish. And so right now I'm leaning towards bearish price action on this. So you have an entry at 7208. So wow, you're in now. Oh, you're long. Okay. I would consider this a counter trend trade. You're trading, but there is some merit to this because we haven't been below this since February this year, late February this year. So there's some merit to it. I think you're trading against the overall dominant order flow right now. Like other than this move right here, I see nothing in the price section since then that suggests that the bulls are taking control of the market or have control of the market. So I see this as a counter trend move. If you are going to get in, this is pretty much, you know, this is about as, and the 7189 is about as low as you could possibly get in. Your stop loss is well-placed, 7167. So yeah, you have a well-placed stop loss. Um, take profit 7565. So let me see if I understand this straight. You have a 40 pip stop loss. And you have a 360 pip target. You have a plus nine R. Are, are you normally taking plus nine R trades? Because you're basically saying, I'm suspecting this level is going to hold and I think it's going to bounce all the way through. Now, I'm not saying this is not going to happen. 
and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but if you normally don't go for plus nine R trades, it seems ambitious to go for a plus nine R trade. Like when you trade counter trend, usually you want to be out faster. So you're basically speculating that not only is the market going to bounce from here, but it's going to bounce 95% of, you know, I mean, since June 12th, all the price section has been below this level. I mean, if you get this, it's kind of one of those trades where if you get it, it's like awesome, but it's probably not going to happen a whole lot. And so unless you're used to getting plus nine R trades consistently, it seems a bit ambitious. Plus you're also trading counter trend. So the market could stop right here and then reject down. And then you get stopped out. It could stop here. It could stop, you know, some point along the way, like you have a meat, you have a lot of meat in front of you to clear through to eat through just to get to your target. You know, contrast this if you were trading you know, with trend, you would have uh, you'd have the overall order flow moving for you. So I'm going to label this counter trend trade. I think it's a low probability trade, but it's high reward. So there is some advantages to that. I see nothing in the near term price action that suggests that the market's going to bounce. Last time it got here, it just dink and took off. And here it's just sitting here. Now we are at the end of the week. U.S. markets are closed because of the holidays, so liquidity is kind of pulled out of the market. That's understandable. Sunday's going to probably look really sluggish, and then Monday we'll start to get some decent flows back in. So you probably won't know whether there's going to be a strong rejection here or not, but I'm seeing nothing in the short-term price section that would lend me to believe that this is going to bounce from here. So that's just my analysis on that one here, but it has potential. Okay. Um, Jason Kidd, make sure you do some analysis like a month, sorry, one sentence analysis on that. Instead of just the trade idea itself, trade idea plus one sentence analysis. Okay, next one goes to Kyla Sin, U R A U D, and then Vojtek Beck, I got you next. Uh, next. Hopefully I uh, said your name right. And if I didn't, I apologize. Uh, what time frame, Kyla Sin? Always time frame. Oh, you did. Sorry, my bad. Bearish trend on daily. Bearish trend daily, foreign range on. Uh, let's go. Yeah, clearly bearish trend. We haven't been above the 20 MA since April 6th. So very bearish on the daily. It just keeps getting rejected, 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 rejected. Um, you're coming to a major support zone. So that's, you know, that's why it's spending more time kind of pressing up against this. You got a major support zone here. Yeah, it's pretty thick because you got, let's open this up a little bit and I can. Okay, so you got some support here, here. This is the lower portion of the zone. This right here is the middle portion of the zone with this and this rejection. And this is the upper portion of the zone here, here, and here, and here. So you have this, you have this kind of, wide range zone you are playing with here. You can't just ignore some of this and not all like, and leave other parts. So you're in a thick zone. I formed a range down the trend. Should we look for pullback to sell downwards? The thing is you're inside now. You see how you're inside like these little resistance areas here. So I think if you're going to sell it, you'd want to see a rally up towards the upper area of this resistance, you know, possibly even up to here, sell it and target maybe the first part of this zone. It's already bounced once. That's probably going to re-attack it and then maybe do a mild, if it does a milder bounce, then that tells you the bears are still in control. If it does a strong bounce, then you should expect it to reverse back to here. But I don't think it's just going to dice through this. If it does, it's going to, you know, run into support here and support here. So you got a very strong support zone. I would not be selling on some sort of breakout right now because you're heading into just a huge zone of potential order flow on the bid. So yeah, I would say at least wait for a rally to 63.74. So hopefully answer your questions. Um, okay, so Vojtek, uh, Vojtek, I don't know how to say your name. Uh, what about your CAD D1? Thank you for the time frame of that. Uh, wow, it's choppy range. Okay, so you got 
this is kind of the range you're dealing with right now. Very choppy. Um, range 50-50. So we kind of got the same range to 54-50. Yeah, we're about we're about in the same place. I can see why you do a little bit higher. Yeah, there's some merit to that too. I think both are valid. Um, along at 50-59. Take profit 54-12. Stop loss 50-25. Yeah, I think it's good entry, good stop loss, good take profit. Because this corrective structure is in sort of the middle of this move, that creates a more neutral environment. If this corrective structure was at the top, then it would be more bullish. If the corrective structure is at the bottom, it would be more bearish. But the corrective structure is in this neutral area. It's in the middle of this last range. So maybe a slight bullish bias because if you look at the range from here to here, this is in the upper half of it. So slightly more bullish, but mostly neutral. I mean, to be honest, you might, I would be looking to trade both sides, sell the top, buy the bottom. Um, we've been inside this since April, and it's probably, unless we get a major run in Europe, it's, I don't see this breaking. This is actually a decent range trade. Let me take some notes on this one. Um, I think there's some really good range trade potential in this one here. Just keep trading this range until it breaks. Yeah. Not bad at all. Not bad at all, Voschek. Not bad at all. Okay. Manu Ramum, understanding the problem is half the solution. You know, I would almost consider even understanding the problem is like a third of the solution because it's often not too hard to understand the problems in a situation. Um, I would, you know, if you look at the spectrum of like, let's say you have an obstacle in your life or a challenge or something that you're struggling with, you have the problem and you have the solution, but you have to definitely understand the problem and you have to, you know, but a lot of people can see problems, you know, it's not, people are much better at seeing problems than they are solutions. That's pro partially because of how our brain is wired. So we're naturally wired to be able to see problems more than we see solutions. Like for example, if you ask somebody to give feedback on say a business plan, they will often be able to spot a lot of the problems then, but then when you ask them for the solutions, they may not have ideas, but it's very easy for them to spot the problems. My approach is understand the problem, you know, identify the problem, understand the problem, analyze the problem, and then you focus 100% of your energy on the solution. Because if the solution was only half the issue, you would have to spend equal amount of time on the solution as you would the problem. But most often in business or in your personal life, you know, it's, it's generally like you spend a lot more time on the solution than you do on the problem. Most of you could probably figure out on your own Hey, you know, I'm probably, you've even probably figured this out, Manu. Like, oh, okay, well, you know, I can do good on demo. I can do good back testing strategies. But when I go live, I'm changing from strategy, strategy, strategy. It's, sh you probably already had the inclination or intuition that your mindset and your emotions were, and your thoughts were causing problems when you were going live. So you probably already had a relative connection with the, you know, the problem itself. Now the question is, how do you, identify a solution and then execute that solution. That's generally more work. So, so yeah, uh, but I'm glad it helped. Uh, Jim Ramon says, I'm a kid. I'm trying to get into trading. Should I start demoing? Absolutely. Start sim demo then live. Do not go live until you've established, you know, you have an edge in the market. Why would you, you know, why, why waste your money and time when you haven't established, you got an edge. So start demo and simulation first. We have a whole free Forex course on how to start with all that process. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. It's also in the, our YouTube channel as well. Um, okay, so Michelle has a question. Wilmer has a question. And then we will get to Stockplit and Ali Ahmad and uh, rest of you that. So, okay. Uh, Michelle, pound Aussie weekly. Oh, very few stock traders. Eh, I understand the market's closed. So you want to look at weekly. Uh, 
Wow, it's like 10 out of 12 weeks bearish. Buy at 76 area. Um, it's a counter trend trade because you're trading against one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So the last 13 weeks, you have 10 bearish. So you're trading against some momentum. There is some slowing down in this because you're getting rejections. You know, before it was mostly closed on the lows. Now you're seeing some rejection. Not surprising that people would start taking profit and they might be running into some bulls. I think it's a counter trend trade. Um, Extended from the weekly 20 MA going into strong support. It's definitely extended. But part of that was because part of the reason why it's extended is simply because of the sharp. It's 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 because of this sharp rejection. The sharp rejection mathematically makes it hard for the 20 MA to catch up. You know, if it was in like a range structure and then started to break out, the 20 MA would be tracking it better. Part of the reason why the 20 MA is there's such a divergence from it is the fact that the market just went straight up and then went straight down. And so because the 20 MA, even though it's going to give equal, it's going to give more weight to recent price action, it's still looking back 20 periods. And since it took it like three weeks to reverse five, six weeks of bullish price action, it's taking a while for that 20 MA to catch up. Granted, there's been strong selling through that. So it's just that the 20 MA took a while to catch up and then it's been playing catch up ever since. So it's not, it's not like the market started off, you know, decently bullish and then it accelerated into a parabolic move and then created distance. It's more of the nature of this reversal. So, yeah. Yeah. So just keep in mind that you're trading counter trend. You know, you have to make it a high R trade because it's a lower probability trade by default. Okay. Uh, Wilmer has a question. Will, good to see you. Uh, if there is a breakout... It is going to be a strong move down if support can be broken. Your CAD. So, Will, uh, the rule is instrument, time frame, uh, and then analysis, basically. So, yeah. So, let me jump to these other questions. Um, and then we'll, if you reframe it with time frame and everything like that, then I can uh, readdress that. Okay. Stockman has the question how to write a trend with a proper stop loss. So the first question I have to ask about that stop plan is um, before you can ride, um, before you can learn to trail trends with a stop loss, you have to be able to do something before that. Who knows what that is? Gene Ramon, you're 10 years old. Holy, wow, I got to watch my language. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I mean, I don't know if I'd want my kid trading at 10 years of age. I've heard that there are some 10 year olds coming out and starting to day trade the market, which is insane. Yeah. It's hard for me to answer that. Um, I don't have kids, so I can't really say I'm an expert on kids, but I do know the brain and I know the brain isn't, you know, your prefrontal cortex for men generally doesn't like solidify the DNA doesn't really get kind of clustered into a good pattern and structure until you're about 24, 25. Um, for women, it's a little bit earlier. That's why women mature faster than the men in the, in the early ages. But yeah, so that's a good question. I know Jesse Livermore started when he was 14. So there's that. Um, but I don't have kids today. In some sense, you know, kids are advancing faster. I mean, I guess it would depend upon your training and background. I'm certainly not going to like promote to a 10 year old per se. I think that would just be immoral and unethical, but I can give you like guidance on how to progress in your process. Um, you know, and just take your time learning this, you know, uh, gosh, if I had the opportunity to learn trading at 10, would I? Yeah, I guess if I had my dad, like if I had a dad that taught me and got me involved in it, I mean, if you're doing this on your own volition, that's pretty impressive. I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say. I, you're the first 10 year old I've had on this. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's cool. And I think you should spend time getting to know the markets, getting to know trading, taking time with it. Don't rush into it. Um, you know, try and treat this like you're learning to play a musical instrument or something like that, or a new language or, you know, some sort of school, a skill. So that would be my recommendation, but 
gosh, if I was trading at 10, where would I be today? Jesus, that would be, I'd be a scary dude. I'd be a scary dude. Um, okay. Okay, so stock plan, uh, the question was, what do you need to do before you manage, um, before you can manage to ride a trend trade? So you're wanting to, how do you ride a trend with a proper stop loss? That's managing a trade. That means you're adjusting the stop loss as the price section goes on. Who knows the answer to this question? Okay, so some of my students got it. Um, Set and forget. Yes. Okay. You have to do set and forget. We recommend hundred trades set and forget. And here's why I'm going to answer that question. So to be able to manage trades in real time, it's that's like an intermediate, it's more towards intermediate advanced skill. Before you can do that, you have to have a skill before that. And you have to have the skill of being able to stick to your trading plan. Now, how do you stick to your trading plan? we recommend starting off doing at least 100 trades set and forget. That means when you want to buy or sell a currency pair of stock or whatever it is, you pick your entry, you pick your stop loss, you pick your take profit, and you stick with that trade completely, whether it hits your stop loss or take profit, you don't make any adjustments to it whatsoever. Why do we teach this? Two reasons. One, you are teaching yourself, you're wiring into your brain the ability to commit to your trading plan. You're going to need to be able to commit to your trading plan. You have to have this skill in place fully if you want to manage trades. The difference between set and forget and managing trades is managing trades has more complexity to it because the market's moving. With set and forget, I only need to make a few decisions. Where's my entry? Where's my stop loss? Where's my take profit? And then the decision just to commit to that, regardless of what happens in the market, I'm just going to let it ride. So you only really have four decisions, but when you're managing a trade, you have those same four decisions, plus you have to analyze the changes in the price action in real time. And you have to ideally have models and frameworks for saying, okay, I will adjust my stop loss if the market does X, Y, and Z. If it creates this structure, if it does this, if it does this. So you've got a lot more to manage and you got a lot more decisions to make. So before you can manage positions and riding a trend, you have to be able to first wire into your brain the ability to commit to your trading plan and be able to execute that 97, 95% of the time. So that means if you do 100 trades, set and forget, you should have between 95 and 97 at a minimum where you do set and forget. You don't touch it, stop loss, take profit. Doesn't matter what happens to the market. Doesn't matter what news comes out. Doesn't matter what hedge fund is long or short or George Soros comes in, you stick to that because your goal is to wire in the habit of committing to your trading plan. If you can't commit to your trading plan and set and forget, you certainly won't be able to commit to it while managing the trade. There's just no way you'll be able to do that. So before I can even answer that question, you would have to have demonstrated that you can commit to your trading plan through set and forget. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that when you do set and forget, as you all know, when you enter a trade, you experience all kinds of thoughts that come into your brain possibly emotions, fear, doubt, worry, you know, uh, there's all kinds of emotions you can experience. And if you're not committed to your trading plan, then any one of those thoughts or worries or doubts or FOMO or fear or whatever is going to kick you off your commitment to your trading plan. And then you will have wired in the habit to yourself of A, not being able to commit to your trading plan and B, that your thoughts and emotions rule you. That's every time you do that, you're digging the groove deeper and deeper. So if you have a trading plan and then your emotions and thoughts kick you off your trading plan, every time you do that, you're wiring that groove deeper and deeper and deeper. If for you, that groove is so strong right now that you have a hard time committing to any trading plan over 50, like 50 or hundred trades. And then you're just, you know, if it's like five trades in, you're changing strategy, you're changing your trading plan, changing pairs, changing timeframes, changing this and that then you haven't wired the habit of committing to your trading plan. You need to unwire that and replace it with the habit you need in place, which is committing to your trading plan. So before I can even answer that question, stock plan, you'd have to have demonstrated that you can 
ride a trend properly or that you can commit to your trading plan. So hopefully answer your question. We'll be sharing in our new course, new methods on how you can manage trades in real time. Um, Alejandro Orozco, hola, ¿cómo te va? Que espero todo bien con usted. Uh, I speak Spanish, so I like to bust out the Spanish when I can. Morning, Chris. What do you think about those traders who say it is better to react than to forecast? Um, I think, I think it, it's, I think the bad play is taking an either or stance in this. I don't think you should be someone who only reacts. I don't think you should be someone who only forecasts. I believe in planning my trades ahead of time and then trading my plan because the more planning I do before the market actually opens, before I actually make the trades, the less I'm using my prefrontal cortex, my, my kind of like cognitive capacities. So you have your conscious mind, your subconscious mind, and your unconscious mind. There's only so much conscious bandwidth I can make available in any one given time. And so if I'm using a lot of that to just react in real time, well, then I haven't had time to plan if then scenarios. So for example, you know, let's look at that. What was the, um, I think it was an Aussie CAD. Yeah, it was an Aussie CAD four hour. So let's say I've been planning for this breakout. And if it breaks out, you know, depending upon how it breaks out, I will either do a breakout or a breakout pullback setup but I'm planning that ahead of time. So when the market actually does it, it's much easier for me to execute it because there's not a whole lot going through my conscious mind. And I already have this plan in place. That's like, Hey, you should be trading this. So the price section unfolds the way I had planned it. And then I already have this plan in place. So I just execute it like nothing, no trigger warnings on my pattern recognition, brain software get hit. So I'm going to execute it. It's much easier for me to execute that than if I'm just reacting in real time. On top of it, I've planned out a breakout or breakout pullback scenario, but I'm also doing if then planning and analysis. So, hey, if the market does this, but then it starts to break down or it shows me signs that the breakout's not gonna happen, if it does this, then I will plan to do this. So the more I plan out my different scenarios, the more prepared I am in real time. So I don't believe in the just reacting because there's no planning involved in that. And that's going to create a situation where there's gonna be situations that come up really fast and I don't have time to plan if then scenarios. And then the other scenario, the, the opposite of why I expect it happens, but I have no plan in place to trade that. And then I have to start thinking in real time. So now I'm occupying more of my cognitive neural bandwidth my working memory in this situation here. And I'm not using my resources for deeper pattern recognition and planning and execution. So I don't, I don't think it's an either or, I think it's better to plan. I don't necessarily think you should forecast. I think you should plan and you should also plan for if then scenarios because I think it's better on a neurological perspective and it'll lend itself to making better trading decisions. So that's my thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, Gary Co. says, Chris, do you recommend not day trading today as it's the U.S. bank holiday? Yeah, why? There's You have a whole giant section of the market that's been, you know, surgically removed from the liquidity flows. <laughs> yeah, why? I wouldn't. I'm not doing any trading today. There's there's no trading for me to do today right now. There's, you know, you're talking a huge portion of the market is not happening right now. There's no liquidity, no flows, whatever. Plus people are going on holiday. So a huge section of the population is, you know, MIA. So yeah, I definitely, it, it doesn't make any sense to me to be doing any sort of day trades today. Any, I mean, really any trading now at this point. Europe, fine, but now that that's over, you're talking, you know, roughly 30 plus percent of the market is out. You know, so that doesn't create an order flow situation that's positive. Stefano's saying regarding the pound Aussie on the 20 MA. 
And we need to go back. Summing up, the extension of the MAA is not always a sign of a possible bounce and pullback to it. it can also just be a consequence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I thought I made that clear, but absolutely. Meaning I'll have to play catch up. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Kenny, Kenny Desmond. Guys, yesterday someone said that the markets will go down on Monday because everyone will have a hangover from this weekend. I don't know. It's just kind of speculation. I mean, what's the overall, it, it depends on what you mean by the markets. You know, if you're talking the stock markets, you know, they're pretty bullish right now. Why would I just make that trade on a speculation that everybody's going to be hung over? Maybe everybody won't be hung over. Maybe, you know, and who's going to be hung over? Just North Americans, you know, just people in the U S I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a, yeah, it just, a, it seems like a strange strategy. I don't know. Okay. Um, Gary asked this question in YouTube and the Zoom. He's like doubling up. It's like, I'm going to get my question asked no matter what. All right, Jan. Jan Galix, or Gaelic, good to see you. Random question. <laughs> uh, when we as retail traders enter the trade on an index Dow, for example, do we participate in the market or do we just bet on direction? I'm kind of confused by this question. If you make a trade in any instrument, whether it's an index or a single underlying or a currency pair, you are participating in that currency pair. If you're trading on a stock, you're participating in, you're part of the order flow in that stock. If you enter in on an index, then you are buying that particular index, which comprises of a group of companies. So if it's the S&P 500, it's those 500 country, companies. If it's the NASDAQ, it's all the companies in the NASDAQ. If it's the Russell, it's all the small caps. So depending upon the index you participate in, that index is a collection and weighting of all the stocks that are inside that. So if you are participating, if you bet on an index, you're betting on the overall index being comprised of all those companies going up or down. That's what you're trading on. An index is just a sum of stocks. Correct. Correct. So you're betting on the index taking a directional play. Hopefully I answer your question. Um, Gallon Loke and then Voshtek is up. Gallon Loke says, hi, Chris, your dollar. Okay, your dollar, one hour. Let's get on it. I haven't seen your dollar in a while. Just haven't been trading the year a whole lot lately. Partially because it just went so busy with stocks. But FX is starting to show some really good trades now. Um, when our entry 112.44 short, uh, stop loss 12.64, TPL 11.94. It's kind of a strange trade for me because the main structure that I'm seeing here is a relative impulsive move. So you have this impulsive move. And this impulsive move took, sorry, I need my back. Where's my back scratcher when I need it? Oh, oh. okay. Sorry about that little jiggy jig dance there. Um, so you're talking from May 27th to June 5th. Okay. So you're talking, you know, about seven days of price action. And then from June 9th, 10th, all the way till today. So about three weeks of a corrective structure. So impulsive, corrective. Seven days buying, three weeks of selling. This to me seems like the main structure in the euro dollar, this corrective structure. So I would be trading this corrective structure, selling the top, buying the bottom with more weight short-term towards selling the top. Why, even though this is more bullish overall, impulsive corrective, which suggests that the next direction, the next leg, impulsive leg should be up. This corrective structure is counter trend. So by selling the tops of it, your stop loss is continually moving in your favor by the nature of the structure. Whereas if you buy the bottom of it, let's say it touches down right here. Well, the structure is continually sliding down. Therefore, it's sliding towards my risk. So while this corrective structure is in play, this channel, I'd be playing the channel. It seems like you're trading inside the middle of the channel. 
which to me seems a little, it's from my experience, trading inside the middle of channels has the least probabilistic edge. So if you were to sell, you know, you'd want to sell towards the upper portion of this channel. If you want to buy, you buy the bottom portion of this channel, or there's been a decent base since June 25th, one, two, three, four. So you could look at that as a potential base, but that's how I'd be looking at that one there, Gallon. Uh, and to you, Kobe. All right. Um, Euro pound. Bullish tech wants the four hour. Okay. I'm going to buy another. I expected a bounce up, but now it looks like that's prepping to break down below the zone. I mean, yeah, hugging this zone like this is not. It's not a positive thing because every time it's hit the zone before it bounced, it bounced, bounce, bounce, bounce. Even when it sold off, it rejected, it rejected, rejected. Now it's just kind of hugging this. I'm gonna look at this on a smaller time frame. There's a lot of wicks on both sides. If there was just wicks on the top side, that would tell me there's more top side pressure because that means that basically every push up is rejected. Granted, there are attempts to push up, but then they keep getting rejected. There are attempts to push up and keep getting rejected. But there is also on the downside here. So really, you're looking at a corrective structure at kind of like a final support, which would be 9,000 and, yeah, 9,000 really. So if you were to long it, you'd want to get as low into this zone as possible like as low into this zone as possible because that gives you the tightest stop loss and the potential greatest upside. But the fact that it's hugging this is not helpful. It's not, right now it's not helpful, but it hasn't like said, hey, we are clearly pressing to the downside. Like it's not doing this. If it starts to do that, then that would skew the probabilities more towards the downside. As long as it continues to go sideways in this channel, so as long as this continues, then you have to just wait until, if you're looking to short, then you have to wait till the level breaks, break out, pull back, or break out. But right now, this is just kind of neutral. There's a dog fight going on between bulls and bears at this level right here. So yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Very interesting chart. Uh, Abi Adebayo. Um, Good job, Chris. Thank you. Can you do some explaining using Ichimoku? You'd have to be more specific. You'd have to pick instrument, time frame, brief Ichimoku analysis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Joshua's question. Um, um, would you say that one hour, four hour is a good place to start for beginners? Depends on what type of trading you're doing, Joshua. If you're going to be doing like short-term swing, not day trading, but if you're going to do kind of like short-term swing trading, maybe you hold it for a couple of days, a few weeks, maybe your longest is a few months, then I think that would be a good, you know, two time frame combo to work with, with your four hour being your higher time frame and your one hour being your lower time frame. Just depends on what type of trading you're looking to do. Uh, if you're doing day trading, I would not recommend that. Uh, Ghazi, Karim, uh, good to see you. Interested to roll in the stock trading course? Would you kindly share any discount? So Ghazi, I think you're a member. If you are, we're sending out a letter today because this is my birthday month. Um, and it's kind of like a special birthday for me. We're doing a special discount for members. For non-members, um, we do have a 20% off discount. Sasha, do you want to text me that code in Zoom and then I'll post it on YouTube? Text it to everybody in Zoom and then post it on YouTube. That'd be awesome. Uh, I'm looking for the code, but I can't seem to find it. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me know when you got that. Um, but yes, we have 20% for non-members and we have 25% for members. Uh, stock points and yes, thank you. Detailed explanation. Appreciate it. Okay, cool. STC, how do you filter pairs on the trading day? Which time frame is best to stick for day trading? Okay, so filter pairs, we're talking about currencies. 
So pairs on trading on the trading day. Do you mean day trading? I think you do. Is it good to avoid line in session to escape the surprise move? Shoot, if I was day trading Forex and I had the opportunity to, if I had the opportunity to day trade the London session, I'd trade the London session. That's where the most amount of currency flows are. So whether there's surprise moves or not, you'll eventually learn the patterns for that. The largest flows are in London. So gosh, if I had a chance to trade the London session, I if I had a chance to trade the London session, I could possibly day trade Forex, but I'm in the US and because I can day trade the stock market and get way more trades day trading the stock market than I can the FX in US, then I do that. Um, but if you're going to day trade, I'd recommend five minute, one hour, and either your four hour daily or weekly for your upper time frame. So I would use your, your five minute as your day trading time frame. And I would use your one hour as kind of your short term you know, context and your four hour daily or weekly is your higher time frame context. Uh, hopefully answer your question. Okay. Jim um, Ramon saying, I'm afraid to hard to understand some of the terminology. Should I Google the words I get stuck on? For sure, make a list of all the words. It's a great question. Um, anything you don't understand, you know, just write it down. Keep in mind, we do have a free Forex beginners course. So Sasha, if you want to, oh, Sasha might not be here. He might be, that's why he's probably not answering. Um, okay, I'll get, let me get the 20% coupon code. Okay. So here's the 20% coupon code. I'm going to put it in YouTube and in Zoom for anybody. Oh, Sasha got it. Okay. So that's the that's for non-members. For members, we will be emailing everybody inside the course the member discount for twenty five percent off. Um, so Jean Ramon, we have a free forex beginners course, and let me get you that one here. Here's the link to this. That will help with a lot of the terminology. Okay. Do we have any video on set and forget? We have some articles on set and forget on our website. So you can go to our homepage, hit the search button, which is like the, the looking glass thing or the magnifying glass thing. Click on that, have a search button, type set and forget. And then we have articles on set and forget. Yes, we do. Okay, guys, we'll be emailing out everybody. Uh, yeah, we'll be emailing out everybody uh, by midday today, the birthday coupon code for members. Happy birthday month. Happy birthday, Chris. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Trade the London books. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, KLK BRXWN. Someone recommends to go live with a small percentage of what you're intending to trade first. This is a way to help you with your emotions. I'd like to know what's your opinion on that. My recommendation is not to do that until you've established that you have an edge on SIM and demo. Think about it like this. If you were going to be an airline pilot, would you, without establishing that you have an edge and the skill as a pilot to fly the plane, would you just throw yourself into a 747 just to test your emotions? No, you wouldn't. I would hope you wouldn't. Would you jump into a Formula 2 car before you've even established that you have good driving skills in a go-kart just to test your emotions? No, you wouldn't do that. If you were a martial artist, would you just randomly start getting yourself into street fights to test your emotions even though you don't necessarily have the skills as a martial artist established yet. No, you wouldn't. So why would you, why would you do that? I get the theory and there is some logic in the idea of, Hey, you should be, you have to learn to deal with these emotions. Like the, the underlying logic behind this theory is look, you're going to have to learn to deal with these emotions it's better if you get it out of the way early 
than not. And I disagree with that because if you jump ahead to something that's outside of your skill level, you're pretty much guaranteeing that you're going to not perform well. So you're already going to not perform well, but then on top of it, you're going to throw in the extra emotional context of losing money. Even if it's a small percentage you don't care about, you're still adding a whole extra context into something that doesn't need to be there. Like trading is already hard enough as is. You'll have plenty of time to work on your emotions with live trading. Why not build the foundation from the ground up really well? And then when you've demonstrated you have an edge and you have the skills, then it's time to start going live. That's You have all the things in place so when the emotions come up, you already have a lot in place to handle the emotions. But if you're still new and developing, you don't have the skills in place, then it makes the emotions harder to manage. On top of it, how you experience those emotions the first time, if you do it without skills, without confidence, without certain things in place, you actually make your learning process longer. So... I understand the logic of what they're trying to accomplish with that, but I, I think it's, I think it's an improper way to learn. So uh, I got a few questions here on YouTube and then, um, okay. Jim asked that Sasha answered that question. Uh, Nikhil Jane, uh, Jane, how do you scan stocks for day trade as I'm trading the U S market from India in a prop trading desk? So we, uh, Nikhil, we've already, um, we posted earlier, but on our YouTube channel, we have already two or three recordings of how we scan for stocks for day trading. We go over the exact framework. We go over the exact stock selection process, all the variables we do there. So I would say start watching that. We also have a whole video on how to day trade. Um, and you day trade the US market from India in a prop trading desk. Yeah, so we already go over that. So. Watch those videos and then join us this Tuesday. Every Tuesday we do live analysis. We do a pre-market analysis, which is basically how do we select our stocks, scan for stocks, filter stocks, do stock selection. We do that every Tuesday. So join us Tuesday and then watch the videos. That'd be the best way to do that. So yeah. Uh, Devin Reactions, I just got here and I'm currently trading this FX. Based on my analysis, I think it is going to up. Do you think that is so? So Devin, the way this works, if you have a question about a currency pair or something you want to analyze, instrument, time frame, and a brief one sentence description of what you see in the market. If you have a potential trade idea, share your entry, stop loss, and take profit, and then we'll analyze that. So that's how we do this. Uh, Andre, I'll happy birthday month. Thank you. Appreciate it. Second Skies community doing great work. Awesome community. Awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Trading small account before addressing underlying emotions could reinforce bad habits, have the opposite effect. Yeah. It just complicates the learning process. Uh, Voschek saying, thank you. You're welcome. Voschek. Okay. Um, Manish is saying, Chris, can you post some trading videos on stocks? I mostly see Forex trades only. Do you mean our live trades on stocks? Like where we review the course members trades? Is that what you're referring to? The reason being is we have, you know, being a community of Forex for 13 years, we're slowly shifting our students over to get more stock traders. But when students in the stock trading course post some trades for potential weekly, so once a week, we do a review of a student's trade, a really good trade. We analyze it. We go over the price section context, areas that I think he could have made adjustments, he or she could have made adjustments to improve. So we teach you how we teach our students to make money trade and how you can improve your performance. Um, for those videos, if you're talking about that, yeah, we'll be doing more stock ones for sure. And probably in the near future, I'm going to be posting some of my own stock trades. I, I already give my day trades to my students in the stock trading course. Like all my day trades, we have an entire channel just for that, where I share all my trades, my option trades, all that stuff. Um, but I'll probably start doing some videos in the near future. Right now, I want to put the, the videos and the live trades effort for my members. But in the future, we'll start doing more videos on that. So yeah, definitely for sure. 
Stefano was saying, I was taking a look at EU stocks that moved today, usually very small as compared to the US IMO. So considering breakout pullback long on KCO. Okay, so let's get to our KCO. Um, I'm going to assume it's this one here. Okay. What time frame? Four. Looks like a pretty clear breakout structure. That's a very clear breakout structure. So yeah, that's how I'd want to be trading this. Yep, super clear. Probably not going to get some resistance to about 5.3 and then maybe 5.6. It can rip past that. You got scope for 5.92 and 6. So would target a bit below 6. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah, it's a pretty clear breakout structure. So you could, I mean, based on the momentum, you could just do the pure breakout trade if you want to. Um, otherwise you could do breakout pullback and then five, three, one, five, six, one. And then just before six, like five, eight, eight or five, nine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Trying to add some EU stocks to look for in the aim session. Might as well. If you're in the, man, I, I am doing everything I can to convince my girlfriend to shift her business so I can live in Europe. Because if I lived in Europe right now, I could day trade the European session, which would be awesome. There's a lot of stocks in the European session that I like to day trade. I'd like to trade the Swiss index. Um, some of the Dutch stocks are pretty good. Some of the German stocks, the UK stocks, FTSE, CAC, Euro stocks. There's a lot of European stocks I like to trade. So I could do two, three hours of the Euro session. Then I could take a break. And then three or four in the afternoon, I could day trade the US session. So I could get two day trading sessions a day. So I could do three hours of trading Euro session, three hours of trading US session. That would just be gold. Like that would be printing money. Like if I could day trade two, two sessions, dear God, like it would just be gold. So I was just saying move to Sweden so you could take advantage of the crazy tax benefits. Yeah. I trust me. I would, if Sweden starts getting better weather and more sunlight, you can get me. That, that That's an easy sell. My girlfriend's from California. There's no way I'm convincing her to move to a place that's cold, not much sunlight, not good weather. It, it just won't happen. I'll have a very unhappy girlfriend and then I will have a very unhappy me. So yeah, not going to happen. Go to Denmark better than Sweden. Really? They have better weather than Sweden? Is that true? I mean, I know they're a little more on the rainy side, but every time I see pictures or videos of like Denmark, it's like, Rarely ever sunny, <laughs> but I mean, Copenhagen looks like a cool city. It looks like a definitely cool city. Oh, I mean, most of the Scandinavian countries seem like they have cool cities. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully I answered you on that one there, Stefano. Okay. Let's see what we got here. STC. Um, thanks, Chris, for the answer. Happy birthday, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I get confused in choosing uh, FX pairs. For example, I found a setup before the uh, session opened on a pair like pound dollar, but that pair did, did do as expected in some other pair like GA. Maybe you meant didn't do as expected, but then some other pair like pound Aussie did, but by the time I found out the move, it already happened. That's where your pre-market analysis, you should have a set number of instruments you go through every single day. You should have a set process for analyzing, for trade planning, for selection. And then after that's done, you can use, then you can use the session for randomly looking for potential trades. But yeah, the, it seems like you have to have a, I don't know if you have a routine that you follow every single time. Like I have a routine that I follow every single time. I sit down to trade. It's the exact same thing. So I just don't miss anything. I have things on my stocks. I have my scanners. I have all my things in place. I know exactly what I'm going to do. If something happens on something outside of my training plan, then either it didn't show up on my scanner or I failed to analyze it pre-market. So it seems like you need a fixed routine for analysis, pre-trade, preparation, planning, all that stuff. 
then once that's done, you're just waiting for that to happen. And as that's waiting to happen, you can randomly filter through your pairs and then just be like, hey, is anything new forming? And if something is new forming, then you trade it. So just one second, I'm blowing my nose here. Okay, he's back. So yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's part of your instrument watch list and you just were distracted by other things at that time, that's going to happen. But you can always set alerts for particular pairs or like if you're like, let's say I, you know, for example, let, let me show you how many stocks I watch and then some. Like this is just on my watch list. So this is North American stocks, Asian stocks, banks, bonds you know, commodities, like I'm watching a lot of, a lot. I'm just watching a lot. ETFs, Forex, global indices, pharma, real estate, small caps. Like I'm watching a lot, hundreds and hundreds of instruments. And on top of it, I have for stock trading, I have scanners that will tell me Hey, such and such is moving right now. So, you know, it filters everything based upon how much movement, volume, and everything like that. So, I have stuff that does a lot of that work for me. So, maybe I didn't catch it in my pre market, but then hour into the session, it starts really developing. So, I look at my scanner and see what's hot. I look at the chart, I do my analysis, and I take it. If it's something that's outside of your pre market analysis, yeah, you might miss something. That's going to happen. You just have to. Let that go and trade what you can trade. If you if you don't find it in time, you don't find it. That's part of the deal. That's always that's that will always be a part of trading. There's no way, there's no trader on the planet that trades everything that they could have traded but didn't analyze ahead of time, if that makes sense. So there's always going to be trades happening while you are focused on something else. If you miss it, you miss it. You there's nothing you can do about it. There's no point in worrying about it. All you can do is trade what you have in your awareness and you trade that and make the most money out of that. That's your job. Yeah, it's just part of the deal. Um, what's the difference between stocks and Forex? We have an entire video on that. It doesn't cover all of the things, but it covers a good portion of that. So let me get you that video. Okay, so we have an entire video on stocks versus Forex. Yeah. Okay, so check out that video for sure. Why you shift to stocks instead of FX, any reason? Yeah, I do cover it in that video. I cover the whole thing in that video, uh, Al Nasir. Um, but I'll, I'll give you three short answers to that. So one, there's way more stocks than there are FX pairs. You know, in the US market alone, there are 30,000 stocks. So by default, I have more trade opportunities in stocks than I do FX. Two, I live in the US, particularly on the West Coast. So because I can't get up for the European session, which is where the most currency flows are, but I can get up for the US session, it makes it economically time zone wise better for me to trade stocks than FX. And three, I just find more trade setups in stocks than I do FX. Like the volatility is there. FX volatility is not huge right now. Stock volatility is like enormous right now. Like stock volatility is awesome. Like the stock volatility right now is like what it was the first month of the coronavirus, like February and early March for FX. It's like that now, but it's been like that for months. So that's why. And when there's volatility, that's it. Devin's saying, where do you send, exactly should you send your analysis? You put it right here. It's just pair, time frame, one sentence analysis. Just post it in the comments. Uh, like Andre in the comment section below you, right below your question, Devin, that's exactly how you should format it. Okay, so dollar CAD. Four hour. Let's get in the four hour. 3627 short touch close 37 3627 
I think you're thinking of trying to selling off this reaction right here. It's not bad. It's not great. This is your best zone to be shorting. This right here. Well, you could extend this up a little bit. That's your best zone to be shorting between here and here. That's a short, to me, that's a good short zone. Now it depends because if this continues to build higher lows, then that would suggest that this zone is under attack because the highs are staying the same, but the lows are continually building. So that would tell me that it's under attack. And so I would probably be quicker to get out on shorts, but if this low stays, maybe it even makes a new low here and then bounces back up, then I'd be shorting and targeting, you know, this and then those lows. So, but this is your better short zone in my opinion. Um, Ali Mogadam is saying, go to Spain. I've thought about it for sure. I The other part is my girlfriend. So that's, that's tricky. Cali weather versus Sweden. Yeah, there's no chance on that. Italy is always an option. Italy has had a lot of problems with the coronavirus. But Italy, if I went to Europe, I think I would either go to um, Spain. I would go to, I mean, the weather in Scandinavia is just not where I'd like it to be. So it'd be very hard for me to live there. You can't live in California for years. You know, when I wasn't living in California, where was I living? You know, Mexico, Uruguay, Argentina. I lived in Montreal for two years, but it would be hard for me to live in that climate for long periods of time. So to go from that to Sweden would just be too rough. I just, yeah, I would not do well physically. But we're considering, you know, if I did go to Europe, it would be Spain, Italy, maybe Andorra would be a possibility. So yeah, that would be, those would be my top choices. Um, how to remove attachment on money. How to remove attachment on money. Could you be a little bit more specific? Like, what do you mean by that? When you say attachment on money, what does that mean to you? I think I understand what you mean. I actually think you're asking something deeper about it, but but I want to see if I understand what you mean by that before I answer that question. It's a good question. 946. Okay, let's see if we can get a little bit more in and then we'll... Sasha's saying you need to live here during the summer months for 6.5 months. You don't have 6.5 months of summer in Sweden. Come on now. Get the tax benefits. Yeah, but I'm getting three months of summer if I'm lucky. And then I'm getting three months of like cold, wet, gray. Summer is awesome. I believe it. But that's like two, three months. Then you can live the rest of the time in Spain, Italy and still have the benefits. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, the other thing is the girlfriend. So. Okay, while you answer that question, YSSJC, uh, Ali Mogadam saying, dollar Turkish lira short daily at seven. I haven't traded Turkish lira in a long time. Uh, daily, let's go weekly then. It's not bad. You have the spike up here, 7073. And you have this spike up here, 725 roughly. It's not bad, but everything's building towards the upside. So it's kind of trading counter trend. We have had some strong rejections. You had a good rejection. But then the last this the last time it even got to seven, it just went past it. So you, it's almost like you're betting that this is going to hold when this held, but then the next time it got up here, it just went right through it. So if anything, I probably want to sell higher up, you know, sell towards the top of this rejection, tight stop above, and then maybe target this. So maybe like, you know, get in, get at the top of this rejection, target the 707, whatever that is, 708. So you get about 17, you know, 1700 pips on that potential and you have very tight stop, but it's just continuing to build, you know, once it starts to stabilize, that could be a good carry trade reversal, but right now dollars just gaining against Turkish Lira. So 
Uh, you must have some superpowers. How the hell do you follow so many instruments when I'm day trading? I can't focus on more than two pairs. Oh, no need to put yourself down like that. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I have a very refined, well-rehearsed process that allows me to scan instruments really, really fast. I also have screeners, you know, like you can get stock screeners that filter out for all kinds of things. That saves me a lot of time for stocks. I have Benzinga Pro, which helps me filter through the stocks as well. So I have a lot of screeners, tools, and I just have a 20 year refined process that I know like the mental representations of what I'm looking for they're just so automatic in my brain that I know what I want to see in charts and I know what I don't want to see. So it's just, you know, for example, like a really good example, of this is an American football, you know, the best quarterbacks aren't necessarily the persons who have the best throwing arms. You know, Tom Brady is still considered one of the best quarterbacks and he's not the most athletic. He doesn't have the fastest arm. He's not physically the most gifted, but one skill he does have is he's able to read defenses really fast. So from the moment he gets out of the huddle to the time he steps up to the line of scrimmage and then looks you know, at the defense, because he's got so much mental representations in his brain, he's done so much work in the film room and then looking at defenses and individual player tendencies and team tendencies and things like that. He's got so many mental maps and representations in his brain that he's able to once the ball is hiked, he's able to throw the ball almost faster than most quarterbacks out there, not because he's most physically gifted, but because he's able to do the mental representations, go through the routes, and his brain just has the pattern recognition because he's built it over time that it's super fast. Like in 2.3, 2.6 seconds from the moment the ball is hiked, that's how long it takes on average for him to release the ball. So he's able to go through his routes, several receivers, analyze the defense in 2.67 2.6 seconds and make a decision and release the football. Like, how do you do that through a really good database in your brain? You have to build that over time. So I just have so many pairs and I have 20 years in the markets that it's just, it's easy for me to scan what I'm looking for and what I'm not looking for really fast. Um, Uh, MR traders, I'm a beginner from India with two years experience in trading. What is your recommendation for beginners like me? Scalping. Scalping isn't based on the time frame. It's important to understand that. I day trade off the five minute, but I'm not scalping. So you can't look at scalping as a time frame. You have to look at, um, you could scalp off the one minute. You could scalp off the two minute, three minute, five minute. So scalping is not limited to specific time frames. Again, I can do day swing trading off the five minutes. So, yeah. Um, my re it depends. So you're basically asking, should you scalp? Should you swing? So first off, you got scalping. In terms of day trading, you got scalping. You got short-term day trading. You got day swing trading, which is where you're basically buying in the early portion of the session. You're closing out at the towards the end of the session, or it hits your take profit or stop loss but you're getting out before the end of the session. So you're holding for the larger move of that session. Short-term day trading is you're just trying to target a specific, you know, in currency pairs, so many pips and stocks, it would be some like 50 cents, a dollar or something like that. And that could take, you know, 20 minutes, it could take a few hours, but it's not the whole session. Scalping is like in stocks, that's anywhere from five cents to like 20, 30, 50 cents. So it's more of like a size that you're going for instead of a time frame. Um, my recommendation is to try all of them individually and then whichever one you do best is the one that you do. I don't recommend one for everybody because some people just have the brains where they're wired better for scalping than swing trading. Some people are better for swing trading than day trading. Some people are better at day trading than position trading. You have to find out where is your where is your sweet spot? And then you just do what you do best. Don't try and do everything. Just do what you do best. Find what you do best and then just hammer the crap out of that. Like that's where you, you just apply your edge as much as you can on that. So that's my recommendation. That's the experimental part of trading is that you have to experiment with what feels most natural. What do you really enjoy doing the most? What do you get most energized with? For me, when it comes to stocks, 
I do not get energized by scalping. I find that it drains my energy. It's not that I couldn't do it skill wise, but I just feel that it doesn't work for me as a person. That doesn't mean it's bad. I know plenty of people who are really good scalpers and they could never do the type of trading that I do. I do a combination for day trading stocks. I do a combination of short-term day trading. I'm generally looking for a $1 move in the market. If I capture more, great, but I'm looking for a $1 move in the market. So if a stock starts at four, I want to get it out of five at a minimum. But then I also do some short-term swing trading, which means I could hold it towards the end of the day. And if it closes really strong at the end of the day, then maybe I'll hold it for a few days. Maybe I hold it for a couple of weeks, but that's my sweet spot when it comes to stocks is short-term day trading, trying to get in and out within 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, two hours max. And then also some short-term swing trading. That's my sweet spot. But that doesn't mean that scalping is better. This is better. It's what's best for you. I had to experiment. I was doing some experimenting with scalping, short-term day trading, short-term swing trading, medium-term trading, long-term trading. And my sweet spot just happens to be where that is. You know, it's the day trading and the short-term swing trading. That's my sweet spot. So that's the thing. You have to find what is best for you. Uh, hopefully I've answered your question on that. Why SSJC? I want huge profit in every trade. I want to 2X, 3X my account as soon as possible. Okay, well, you, it's not that you can't do that, but it comes with high risk. Remember, when you increase position size, it doesn't matter what your strategy is, you're always increasing risk of ruin. So, you know, there is a possibility. Like I had, I used to have a friend who I no longer consider a friend because he was very disrespectful to me, but I used to have somebody who, they were trying to double their account every single month. And to do that, they had to trade very, very aggressively. Part of the reason why they had to do that was because they kind of had this brain that was wired for like super high risk gambling, like, you know, high hormonal thing, you know, it was just, and that works for them, but they also go through huge crashes, like huge ups and downs. Like if they're winning, they're great. If they're losing, they're just tanking. Like, like he basically contacted me. He's like, dude, I need therapy. You know, like he was that depressed because he was having such a bad swing. And then like weeks later, he's making some money and then he's insulting me. It's just kind of, I don't know. It's, it's really, it's really sad he did that. But yeah, you could be someone who just have wired your brain in kind of an addictive type way that you want to be more of like a gambler punter that you just, you don't like, maybe your brain just doesn't get stimulated unless you've, doubled or triple your account like to do 20 percent a year for you if you could do it you would probably end up trying to double trip your account anyways and you might lose money long term doing that but because your brain's addicted to that gambling you know high risk you know high emotional swings high adrenaline type swings that's a possibility you have that i don't know you so it's hard for me to say but when someone says i want huge profit in every trade you know, you want to double your, triple your account as soon as possible. Sure, everybody wants to do that. But the question is, are you willing to take the steps to get you there? You know, are you just wanting that because you just want money? Or are you actually wanting that because you've learned over years to, well, I can double my account, you know, over a couple months. So now I want to try and triple my account over a couple months. Like there's a difference there. If you're someone who's built up your skills over time, to where you can double your account through high risk trades over a month. And now you're like, Hey, I want to take it to the next level. I want to increase it by 150% over the same time period. That's different. But if you're someone who's not making money in the markets right now, and you're just like, I want to double my account, then that's probably a mindset thing going on. So yeah, hopefully answer your question. Wherever you fall in that spectrum will probably tell you. Uh, Bismillah is saying, I'm also in profit. Thank you, sir. Okay, cool. Awesome. That's good. That's good to hear, Bismillah. Uh, June 12th, who wins Chris's brain recognition or machine rec recognition? Who wins Chris's brain recognition or machine recognition? I mean, it's... Machines have a massive advantage. They can do more calculations, but they don't have as much experience as I have. So yeah, 
Mauricio is saying what broker platform this, this isn't a broker platform. This is a charting platform. It's trading view. Uh, it's our recommended charting package. And to you, Andre, uh, what's swing trading? Uh, Jim Ramon, swing trading is you're trying to capture major swings in the market that could take days or weeks. So yeah. Okay. Let's see. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Yanni and, uh, and Sasha are going over Denmark versus Sweden. Denmark is better climate wise, but not the same tax benefits as Sweden has. There is that. That's still, that's a good point. Okay. Market this week was terrible. Really? I thought it was a great week for the markets. Maybe the markets you were trading, but stock markets were great this week. We had huge volatility. We had some great trades, some good option plays out there. Like we had, we had, we had a pretty good week. We struggled on, I think we struggled on either Monday, Tuesday or Tuesday, Wednesday. Like we were either flat or slightly negative those days, but then Thursday we did really good. Thursday we did really good. We also, it, it wasn't just Thursday that we did good with the trades we initiated that day. Thursday we did good because a lot of trades that we had done before, we were now able to close. Like we were able to close GDX. I've been long GDX for quite a while. Um, and I got to close some of my GDX positions. So I had been long GDX. I had bought uh, the breakout. I missed the pullback here, but I bought the breakout of this. And I've been long-term bullish on it. And I felt like, hey, as long as it holds this, I'm still going to stay long. And it bounced. And it got pretty much close to our target. What, I think we closed at like 36.90 or something like that. In the Discord chat, we were like, hey, we're closing, we're out. So I got to you know a pretty decent sized position from low 34s to like 36.90. It's two dollars and ninety cents. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good trade. And I still have some of the position on right now because I'm assuming that this structure is going to hold. So you know Thursday was a good day because we initiated a short trade on Norwegian cruise lines. That's in profit right now. We had got to close this trade for profit. Our IAG trade is in profit. Um, so our IAG trade is in profit and I got two option plays towards the end of the day, TLT. And I'm still not remembering the other one. What the hell was the other one? I know there's another option play out there I took, but I got two option plays and those are already well in the money. So, so yeah, yeah. Thursday was a good day. Great way to end the week. Forex for you. Are you saying the Forex market was terrible or just your trading of the Forex market was terrible? Um, STC, as your as per your experience, what is a what is a realistic percentage gain in month in FX in a moderate way? It's kind of an ambiguous question. Like, are you saying me moderate, you moderate? I don't know you, so I'm like having to speculate. I'm having to speculate on what your moderate is. Um, I it's hard for me to say because a majority of my trading now is in stocks. If I move to Europe, then I'm going to reshift a fair amount of my trading to FX. But until that happens, I'm trading mostly stocks right now. Um, but yeah, me moderate versus you moderate is two totally different things. I can tell you right now for stocks, I try and target 10% a month. That's what I'm trying to target every single month. So my goal is 100 to 120% gain at the end of the year. That's my goal. And the thing is, I had to move to a new platform in April got there like late, mid, late April. And my goal is still that by the end of the year, I'm up over hundred percent. That's my goal. <laughs> is percent risk the same as lot size? No, because they're independent. They're re it's yeah. And your account's always in flux. Percent risk is percent risking of your account balance. Yeah. Lot size will affect what is percent risk but it's not always the same because a lot on some currency pairs can be worth more or less than others. How do I become a member? I want to be in these stream regularly. If you want to be on these stream regularly, uh, every Tuesday we do free stock and every, every first Friday of every month we do a stream in terms of becoming a member because you're 10, I technically would have to force you to like, I wouldn't want you to just become a member. Like, you have to get parental permission for that. I, that's the only way I could do it honorably. 
um, you're like your parents would have to be fully informed, you know, they're covering it. They all that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, what currency pair will you choose for day trade? If someone told you that only one instrument you're allowed to trade. Wow. What currency pair? I need something with volatility. If it doesn't have volatility, I can't trade it. Um, being that I'm in the U S right now, I'd probably choose dollar max, dollar max, because it's got the volatility. In North America, that's some of the best volatility. I know cat dollar cat is starting to pick up, but it's not always like that. Um, a currency pair that's been consistently good for me in the past. My top currency pairs of all time are dollar cat, dollar max, Aussie Kiwi, and Kiwi dollar. Those are my top four currency pairs over time. But that's me. You know, it may not be the same for you. But if I had to only trade one pair being in North America, I need something with volatility. I need something with moving. That'd be dollar max. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. We seem to be running out of questions at this point. So if that's the case, and it's been two hours. So, okay, cool. Um, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, in the U.S., it's also a holiday this weekend. So in case you don't know that, that's why the U.S. is closed today. So this will allow me to get out a little bit earlier today. But um, great trading session today, guys. In the future, I'm not going to split it between Zoom and YouTube. I'm just going to have everybody do on YouTube. So Sasha, take note of that for the future. Um, when we set this up, we'll just set it up on YouTube because then everybody's in one place. I don't have to split. And also, like, YouTube comes at a delay, but Zoom doesn't. So, you know, be it's just it seems like it's more smooth if we do it all on one side. So um, great session. Um, great trading with you guys. Be here next month, first Friday of every month. And then every Tuesday morning, we do stock pre-market analysis, 30 minutes before the U.S. stock market opens. So 6 o'clock Pacific, sharp, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York. So be there for that. Other than that, um, have a great trading, or have a great weekend, holiday weekend, and have a good trading week next week. Uh, if you want to take advantage of the 20% coupon code, we've posted it. Um, but let me make sure you all have it again. I hope that you get to become members. If you become stock trading members, you get to see all my day trades. I have an entire channel just for day trading where everybody gets to see all my day trades for that. Other than that, uh, have a great weekend. I hope to be working with you in soon. Best place will be Monaco. I've thought about Monaco many times. Definitely thought about Monaco, especially since you got the Formula One there. But I have a lot of trader friends uh, in Monaco. And I hate to say it, but... I don't think Monaco would be my jam. Um, I don't think Monaco would be my jam. There are about 3,000 Bloomberg terminals in Monaco. And that means, so that means there's a lot of traders in Monaco. Um, so I think it'd be great in terms of trading environment. You got Formula One. There's a lot of money and things like that. But I have a really good insight. I have a friend who's from there and he's like, look, dude, he's like, you will not be able to go to any sort of party or anything like that without people constantly talking like how much money you got how much money this and that and girls wanting you for your money or dissing you because you don't have money like that's just not my style i'm a pretty low-key kind of guy i prefer to be under the radar like i really prefer to be a private person under the radar like i'm public in terms of my business but in my personal life i'm just a private dude who likes to just like wear t-shirts and shorts and walk down the street and nobody knows me and nobody cares about how much money i have or don't have or that's just me i'm a pretty low-key kind of guy so um, I think Marie, I think Monaco would be cool in some ways, but I hate to say it, but I don't think it'd be my jam, but there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's totally cool. Uh, I think it's a great place and I have a lot of good friends there. So yeah. Uh, thank you for the happy birthday wishes. I appreciate it a lot. It was awesome seeing you all, uh, good having such a great session today here as well. Uh, and happy independence day to us Americans. Yes, for sure. Um, other than that, have a great weekend, everybody be well. I hope to see you guys this Tuesday. Take care, everyone.